Hey everyone, today we'll dive into sexual selection. We'll discover what you can learn about a species behavior just by looking at its skull. And we'll talk about if any of this applies to us, the modern cultured human. Let's go. heard about evolution and its main mechanism, natural selection. Let's talk about the basic idea in 60 seconds. Let's put it on the clock. Evolution is the basic idea that species change over time. And with enough time and gradual slow change, those species will become new and different species. This was a huge idea 250 years ago. Up until that point, almost everybody thought that the natural world is fixed and created by a god ever unchanging. As a trained biologist, I'm obligated by law to immediately shout the name of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin! The moment I talk about evolution and natural selection. But Darwin wasn't the one who came up with the theory of evolution. Him and Alfred Russell Wallace were the geniuses though, who discovered the mechanism by which evolution is happening. And that mechanism is natural selection. Natural selection means that individuals within a species are different from each other. And those differences are the reason that some of those individuals survive and others die out. The individual that survives will pass on those characteristics or those traits onto the next generation, onto their offspring. Well, the individual that die will not. Those traits, well, they die out. That's their basic idea. But Darwin had a huge problem with his hands. Some smart critics rightly pointed out and pointed to animals like the peacock and its huge feathers and saying, what about that dude? Those feathers are not adaptive. They do not help that peacock survive. How do you explain that, Charles? To understand sexual selection in humans, we first have to grapple with Darwin's problem and see how he solved it by the means of sexual selection in animals. And to do that, we have to travel to Barcelona. Vamanos. There was one animal though that Darwin was worried about, the peacock. He wrote to his American botanist friend, Asa Gray, that whenever he thinks about the feather of a peacock, it makes him sick. And he was rightly worried because his critics pointed out if natural selection was true, why would the peacock have these huge ornaments, these huge feathers that make it very cumbersome to walk and to fly? But let's think about this for a second. Natural selection says the most adapted, quote unquote, the most fittest individual has the most offspring and therefore spreads the genes within the population. But survival isn't the key here. It's leaving offspring. So reproduction is king, not survival. It's reproduction of the fittest. If you leave the most offspring and then you die, you did your part, you succeeded. Darwin was aware of this and he came up with a new theory to amend natural selection, which is sexual selection. Meaning members of one sex of one species choose to mate with specific members of the opposite sex within the same species. The key point with sexual selection is whatever sex has the largest investment in offspring care is usually the choosiest. And on average, that's mostly the female of a species because the female invests more in a, within a peacock. She invests more in the egg, in fat and protein and egg production and also in, in sitting on the egg and rearing it. The male just invests his sperm. Very small investment, very low energy investment. Meaning he doesn't have to look for quality. He can look for quantity. The more he mates, the more offspring he will have. A female peahen though, on the other hand, has to be choosy because she cannot have 10 offspring at the same time and then she has to rear them. Peahen takes days to choose one specific peacock, usually the one with the largest ornaments to mate with. What does that have to do with the peacock and the feathers? The peahen starts choosing a male with larger feathers. Peacocks with larger ornaments and larger feathers get more offspring. And this will create a positive feedback loop, leading to more and more males with larger and larger ornaments and feathers because they are the ones producing the most offspring. So it's not only natural selection pushing on them by predators and environmental factors, but there's also sexual selection pressure moving towards larger and larger feathers. So why would the peahens choose males with large feathers and ornaments? Darwin himself had one theory, and that's one of the two main hypotheses for this question. He thought because of arbitrary beauty standards different in every species, he thought the peahens choose the brightest and the largest feathers just because they quote unquote like them. They just fancy them. They like bright, shiny, symmetrical colors and feathers. So it's purely arbitrary beauty standards. As a peahen, if you then all of a sudden choose to go against the grain and not choose a mate with the brightest and largest colors, 
which will mean your sons all of a sudden do not get the genes for beauty and your sons will leave less offspring. So it is a runaway effect, a positive feedback loop, also called the sexy son hypothesis. Yes, evolutionary biologists love their funny nicknames, but it's literally called the sexy son hypothesis because you want to make sure your sons get the genes for the beauty standards within your species. So that's hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two was that the beauty standards within species are not entirely arbitrary, but communicate certain fitness standards. As in, it's extremely hard to be very, have large feathers and have high symmetry and beauty within your feathers if you're sick or if you have parasites or if your genes aren't good. It's way easier or way more probable that you have asymmetrical features in animals than symmetrical beauty features. You really have to be, quote unquote, extremely healthy for those beauty standards to be a case. So in other words, beauty is a proxy measure for fitness and health. And therefore, females choose pretty or beautiful peacocks, not alone because they're pretty, but because it tells them that these are the best genes you can get. So those are the two theories, the sexy sun hypothesis and the good gene hypothesis. So you might ask yourself, and rightly so, why is any of this useful when you think about behavior? Let's do a thought experiment. I give you the skull of a female and a male of a species you know nothing about. So just armed with the tools and the knowledge of sexual selection, you will be able to infer a lot of behavioral traits from that species. Especially if you look at the sexual dimorphism, we call it, the difference in size from this male skull to the female skull. For instance, bonobos and gorillas, the males are double or triple the size of the female. And that allows you to say a lot about their social behavior. For instance, aggression in males is high in those species. Life expectancy or the difference in life expectancy is larger. Males live a shorter life, have a shorter life expectancy than females. We know about parental behavior of the dad, of the, of the males, which usually is almost non-existent, the higher the sexual dimorphism. Species where there's almost no sexual dimorphism and the female and male are almost indistinguishable from each other, those are usually pair bonding species. And they have uh, low aggression males. The life expectancy is almost the same. Parental behavior of the dad is more involved. So by just looking at the skulls of a species, you know nothing about and using the tools we learn about sexual selection you have very high probability cause of making an inference about what the behavior of that species will be like and i think that's freaking amazing that's really cool so the main question now is what about us what about humans are we a tournament species do we have sexual dimorphism or are we pair bonding species was it really necessary to fly to Barcelona to watch some peacocks? No. Was this weekend trip already planned before I thought about a video topic of the month? Maybe. The point is, what does sexual selection tell us about human behavior? So where do we land on the spectrum of sexual dimorphism and sexual differences? Are we more a tournament species or are we more a pair bonding species? You might have guessed it already. Humans are smack in the middle. On average, male and female are distinguished from each other by appearances. It's not as obvious as with gorillas or baboons, but we're not identical either. When we talk about male and female in humans, I'll be talking about biological sex and usually differences on a group level, so averages. Number one, life expectancy. Life expectancy is pretty straightforward. Almost every study in every country in the world shows that women live longer than males on average. The larger the life expectancy within a country, the larger the difference between women and men in life expectancy. Those differences in life expectancy are different between countries. They can be large, as in Russia or the United States or Western Europe, up to 12, 10, eight years, or they can be lower like in India and Bangladesh, where it's almost zero or one year difference. There are two main factors to this. It's behavioral and resistance to disease. On the behavioral front, men are more likely to take risks. They're two times as likely to die during accidents. On the other hand, it's also resistance to disease. Men are more likely to die because of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, liver disease. One of the explanations could be testosterone. Testosterone doesn't only influence brain development in males more than in females, especially prenatally, but also during puberty, and therefore influences risk-taking behavior, but also has an influence on disease resistance, especially cardiovascular disease. Behavior number two, aggression and violence. This is another extremely robust finding, and there's only one way to interpret the data. Men are on average, across all countries and continents, 
way more likely to be the victim and the perpetrators of aggressive behavior or violence. Looking at the most recent available statistics from the United Nations, we find this picture. Men are always more likely to be the victim of homicides in every region, but more importantly, they are the perpetrators 90 to 95% of the time. That is an insane one-sidedness. Let's talk about the third and last one, marriages and infidelity. And this is an iffy one because it becomes even more personal. We can look at infidelity rates and cheating. Even though these data are not perfect because not everybody honestly reports on the behavior of cheating, they give us a rough estimate on where we are on the spectrum between pair bonding species and tournament species. On average and in meta-analyses, you find numbers between five 10 and 25 and 30 percent on the upper ends, depending on the age group and the sex or the gender of the person. Men are usually more likely to cheat and in the last 30, 50 years the numbers have also gone up. This can just be reported but it could also be the actual numbers going up. So what have we learned? Sexual selection is an extremely powerful tool to explain much of evolutionary change in behavior in animals. In humans, it becomes a bit more complicated. We're neither clearly a tournament species with huge extremes in differences in sexual dimorphism, but we're not identical in behavior or aggression or life expectancy either. And we're not perfectly pair bonding. Men are more aggressive and violent and live shorter lives. Makes sense, right? We see the same pattern in males of tournament species. Males have to compete with other males for access for females. So we do see dimorphism in bone structure, muscle mass, and levels of aggression and violence. I think sexual selection is an amazing tool to understand human behavior. It doesn't explain everything, but it is a great start. Just like our bodies, our brains and minds have been molded for eons of sexual selection and competition to leave us with what we have today, human nature. If you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe here on the right or down below. Your support is truly appreciated. Today we'll dive into sexual selection. Sexual selection. Sean Connery talks about sexual selection. He's looking at me as well. Field work is a nightmare. People, it's fine, we just adapt. We adapt. We adapt. Are we rolling? Rolling? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Are you sure?